Okay, take a look at these two phones. This is what $350 buys you from LG. This is what it buys you from Samsung. It's plastic. Or take a look at LG's last flagship phone, the V60. Spec for spec, it is surprisingly comparable to Samsung's Galaxy S20 or S20 Plus. The same chipset, 8K video, stereo speakers, and yes, Samsung has a better display, but LG has a better battery and a headphone jack. And while Samsung's phone is still hovering at around the $700 mark, I got this for 400, brand new. So it begs the obvious question, how is it that this company is storming ahead? There are almost 30% market share globally, while this company's at barely two. How is it that Samsung is having record-breaking sales while LG is looking like they might need to take a step back or stop production entirely? Well, take a closer look at this V60, and thanks to Dashlane for sponsoring this video. Okay, this is how the phone came to me, and to be honest, it's an immediately impressive device. I got it for around the same price as the OnePlus Nord, which is a phone with plastic sides and mid-range internals, and it was way cheaper than some of Samsung's phones that are entirely plastic. This is solid glass and metal. It kind of feels like a slightly tankier version of the Galaxy S10 Plus in design, and even actually has a US military level durability certification. You do feel the lack of screen refresh rate, and I would say that the notch up top makes it look kind of generic, but it's a good screen. You've got to remember that LG makes some of the best TVs on the market right now. I'm using two of them on either side over here, and when you look at the screen, you can feel it. Plus, I got to admit, even though LG's software skin does look a bit like knockoff Samsung, there's some interesting stuff here. You can take 3D photos, which is definitely a gimmick, but it's a fun one. It has ASMR video mode. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it basically takes the quiet sounds and amplifies them. It is missing a telephoto camera, which is a bit of a shame, but the main 64 megapixel sensor is pretty solid. And you know how I mentioned it has a headphone jack, right? It's not any ordinary headphone jack. Providing you've got a decent pair of headphones to plug into it, they will sound better than on any other phone. Any other phone. Thanks to a quad DAC inside that basically just gives your headphones the juice they need to run at their best. MKBHD made a really interesting video about why people don't buy Sony phones, and he highlighted how they were better than they were given credit for, but I would argue that LG phones, just given how cheap you can get them, are even better versus the credit that they get. So why does no one buy them? Well, as I've been describing this V60 to you, would you say it's left an impression on you? Would you say it's left you with a clear idea of what LG is all about? Probably not. Almost everything about this phone, or really all their phones, from the design choices to the software skin to the feature set, they don't feel cohesive. They feel like just a random assortment of choices without any real clear objective. Kind of sounds a bit like my life, to be honest. The point is, I don't know what this is meant to be. And I think it's because LG doesn't know what it's meant to be. Put it this way, when you think of Apple, you might love them, you might hate them, but you probably feel something. It might make you think of the really satisfying unboxing experiences. It might make you think of clean lines and quality. It might just make you think of high prices, but you do have an association. Even Sony, as many mistakes as they've made in the smartphone market, they at least know who they are. Sony phones are photography focused with tall aspect ratios and Sony industrial design. But with LG, even as someone who owns like 10 LG devices, I couldn't tell you what their deal is. If you go back through their past smartphones, you realize that with every new generation, they just tried something. It usually didn't take off, so they dropped it. Then they tried something else, and then they dropped that too. They gave one of their phones a mini secondary display. They made one of their phones modular. They built curved phones. They even had like vein recognition for unlocking. Don't get me wrong, not all of their ideas were bad ideas. This isn't a wish.com scenario. For almost a full year, LG was the only major player with an ultra-wide camera. They were one of the first to pay attention to creators with a proper manual video mode. LG was, they were one of the first in the world with not just a quad HD smartphone display, but also laser autofocus. LG was an innovator, but by not sticking to the things that they did try, instead just hopping from one idea to the next, their brand just stopped meaning anything. Meanwhile, they were giving their competitors time to, to basically take their half-baked ideas, spend time on them, and do them better. The point is this, if you can't cultivate a strong emotional connection to your brand, then even if someone does buy an LG phone one year, they've got no real attachment to it. 
And so unlike Samsung and especially Apple, LG had one of the lowest levels of customer loyalty. Or in other words, the minute that another brand comes out with a phone that looks cooler, LG users would be very likely to just jump ship. The company is now teasing a rollable phone, and I would love for this to work out for them, but chances are it's just going to follow the same path as the rest of their half-baked concepts. Okay, I also think LG's naming convention is a big part of their problem. So historically, LG has had two main series of flagship phones. They've had the G series and they've had the V series. And that's fine, that works. But then why did the G series go up in ones, G2, G3, G4, but the V series went up in tens, V20, V30, V40? And then why did the budget phones go up in both tens and ones? Like you've got a K42, you've got a K51S, they've got a Q60. And straight away, this makes the number itself meaningless. And it means that as an average consumer looking at LG's entire lineup, I've got no idea what's what. It's like trying to learn a new language. Das ist nicht gut. Anyway, uh, the worst bit is thank you. Every single one of these flagship phones, presumably to try and make them fit in with LG's wider smart home brand, had the word thank you slapped onto their name. What were they thinking? It's unnecessary, it makes it look really complicated, like a phone for nerds, and I imagine a lot of people's first thought is, how do I even pronounce that? If I can't tell you the name of my phone, am I really going to be spreading the word? I'm being a bit dramatic, but naming is important. Like if you think about how widespread the excitement has been as Sony's moved from the PlayStation 4 to the PlayStation 5, do you think they'd have the same level of excitement if they'd moved from the WQSJ47 to the WXJKLL? Mm, probably not. Now, thankfully, it looks like LG has finally got the hint. Because Velvet is the simplest, nicest name they've given to a phone in a long time. And if you are enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be remarkable. Now, do you want to know what their biggest problem is though? It's pricing. And you might be thinking, well, you said earlier that LG phones are really cheap. They were when I bought them, but at launch, they were not. LG's problem is less about the price itself, more the fact that they can't seem to stick to one. Like this Velvet, yes, I bought it for $350, but when it was announced less than a year ago, it was 600. Or take the LG G7 smartphone. In the UK, it launched at £779, and within six months, it was $299. That is the worst value retention I've ever seen. And I think a big part of it is sales. Now, putting a smartphone on sale isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think some companies do a really good job with these flash price drops, but those only work if you put the prices straight back up to normal as soon as you're done. But if we go back to that G7 price graph for a second, this phone was on permanent sale two days after becoming available. Maybe it didn't get as many pre-orders as they were hoping for, so they dropped it. But if you're this flexible with your price, Who's gonna take it seriously? Like who in their right mind is going to buy an LG phone at full price if they can wait two weeks and get 20% off? And then who's gonna buy it at that price if they can wait another two weeks and get another 20% off? What LG need to do is to pick a lower starting price and stick to it. If they'd launched this Velvet phone at $400 instead of $600, I think sales figures would have been in a completely different ballpark. I think the three slash four star reviews that it got would have become four slash five star reviews. And most importantly, it would have started to make the LG brand mean something. Value. Also, on this note, if you have the option to be cheaper than your competitors, you should do it. Like with this flagship phone, the V60, the company launched at $900. And that's not bad in an age where top-end phones are 1200. But for some reason, LG decided that with some of its carriers, they would bundle in the secondary display, worth up to $200, to turn it into a sort of B-Tech foldable phone. What proportion of normal smartphone users do you think want this kind of phone experience? 5% maybe? What LG should have done is to forget the second screen and make the phone $700. Being cheaper than your competitors is the best selling point you can possibly have. And I would say the final nail in the coffin for LG is that they've just done a poor job with the press, with YouTubers and the media in general. Now, this isn't me saying that I deserve review samples or loan units, but almost every time I've tried to contact LG, whether it's because I wanted to attend a launch event so I could cover it, or even just to ask a question about a product, no matter how I've contacted them, I've been met with something along the lines of, we'll get back to you. They do work with some media in the United States, but globally it just feels like they almost don't have a PR team. 
I don't personally mind paying for my own devices, it's what I did for all of these, but I don't think LG's Apple. I don't think they're in a position where they can afford to do this. Think about it. For most reviewers and for most writers, if they have to go out and buy LG phones just to cover them at their launch prices, they then have to wait two extra weeks compared to the US journalists who might have got them for free and early, or two weeks and two days if they wanted a discount, only to then create a piece of content that probably doesn't earn back what they paid in the first place because not that many people are searching for LG phones. Who's gonna do this? Where LG is right now, they need relevance, they need conversation. You know, part of the reason that LG has this problem that no one really knows what they're about is yes, they have mixed messaging, but it's also just the fact that the average person never sees anyone talking about them. And the solution is honestly as simple as just finding people who want to cover these devices and giving them access to do that. There's one barrier though. There's one thing that makes LG's situation even tougher than it seems. It's the fact that with a lot of markets and the smartphone market in particular, when companies get ahead, they get further ahead. And when companies fall behind, they get further behind. And this is the position that LG finds itself trapped in. Let's say I had a smartphone company of my own. And let's say that one year my market share fell from 20% to 10%. This is even more of a problem than it sounds like. For starters, I'm making less profit, which means I've got less money to reinvest into making my next phone better, which is what I would need to do. Secondly, because I'm only selling half as many phones, I'm only ordering half as many components. And the way it works in these markets means that you get a less good deal because of this. You pay more per component. But what makes this even worse is that even though I'm selling half as many phones, I'm still paying full price for all the fixed structures that are in place, or my factories, or my storefronts. On top of all that, once you lose a customer to Samsung, to Apple, to Xiaomi, you would have to do something even better than them to win them back. You're no longer the default option for that customer. So we're in a market where Life's not good for smaller phone brands. They either die, like Amazon's Fire, or they get acquired, like HTC by Google, or they are already just a sub-brand generated from one of the bigger brands. The big companies are almost too far ahead for the smaller ones to compete. Okay, let's talk about Dashlane, an app whose entire premise is to make the internet easier. So you've probably been told at some point that the internet is unsafe, that you're constantly at risk of being hacked while you're online, and that you should make each of your account passwords not just unique, but also complex enough that they end up looking like an entire novel written backwards. But who's going to remember them? That's what Dashlane's for. You basically just use your fingerprint or your face ID, and Dashlane will then be able to instantly autofill all your details onto any site. Now, there's a decent chance that you're already using like Google Chrome's default autofill software, which is fine, but there's two key advantages to this. A, it's faster. Because it works no matter which device you're using, I could be autofilling something on Google Chrome on my Mac, but then I could pick up my iPhone, open a Safari browser, and still have the same details ready to go. And two, it's safer. Because instead of just remembering a password that you typed in, Dashlane can auto-generate the best passwords for you. So you can have every single one of your accounts like completely locked down, but at the same time, the only thing you'll ever need to access them is your biometrics. So I've left a special link down below for Dashlane. It is actually completely free to use, but if you do go through this link, you can upgrade to premium for 50% off. Okay, thank you so much for watching. My name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one.